welcome to this first colloquium of archaeology and restoration Mexico Cambodia. My name is Bertrand Lebrun, I'm associate professor of the Humanities Department of the University of Monterrey, and for this event I will be performing as moderator. Now I give the floor to Master Fernando Aceves Humana, who was able to join wheels, energy, and researchers in these historical events and will be in charge of introducing the binational authorities that can, who accompany us tonight. Good evening to all of you. Good morning, Cambodia. I had a chance to visit Cambodia and it was decisive in my life. Each archaeological site has a particular environment and ambience. Each site has its unique features and there is a similitude that we really don't understand well, which joins many coincidences, especially the type of soil, the weather, which would allow interchanges in terms of archaeology with Mexico for over 100 years. I am a painter and I am really thankful that the group of archaeologists has accepted me and that thanks to them we are able to have this first colloquium, this first approach between both countries. I thank very much the presence of Punsakona, Her Excellency the Minister of Culture of the Kingdom of Cambodia, who is here with us tonight. And it is a great honor to have her here. The Secretary of Culture, Alejandra Frausto, told us that she was not able to join because today is an elections day in Mexico and officers have bound to be present in events. But anyway, she accompanies us and wishes us luck. I also want to thank the Attendance of anthropologist Diego Prieto, General Director of the National Institute of Anthropology and History, who is here with us. Also to have you, General Director of the National Apsara Authority of Cambodia, come to Picar, General Director of the National Authority of Prea Vigea, Director of the Royal University, where the Shar workshop is located Sun Sopiaka Nian Sochea and my friend Chan Vitarini. I also thank your collaboration and especially to Chao Sung Keria without whose support this encounter would have not been possible. We have been working on this organization for many years and it is thanks to her will and support that this is possible. As she and I have said, we really wish with all our hearts that this first encounter can give results that can be seen in, in archaeological and academic collaborations between both countries. I also like to thank all the archaeologists who accepted to work with us here for this encounter in a solidary way. And this colloquium has a very nice basis, which is to inspire youths and in a given moment where they could doubt on which career to choose, we would pose a question to all archaeologists, which is, what inspired you to be an archaeologist? What made you decide in your youth to choose archaeology and to devote your life to archaeology and restoration. Thank you very much. I would also like to hear some words from Her Excellency Minister Pim Sakona. Yes, I would like to give some uh, short speaker, uh, some word to uh, our colleague. Uh, first of all, so, uh, I would like to express my uh, gratitude uh, because today I have a great honor uh, because, uh, to be here with all of you, uh, the organizers, panelists, uh, and all the, also all the participants. I think that it is really a good opportunity and also initiative 
to join Mexico and uh, Cambodian together for sharing the knowledge uh, in the topic of archaeology so that uh, two countries it seems far away but uh, both countries both countries we have a great history a great civilization uh, of, of a great temple you know it is very famous uh, all around the world so that uh, let me Let me say on behalf of the ministry and our government, thank a lot for uh, organizing this, uh, uh, this uh, joint meeting, uh, giving uh, knowledge to all the participants. Very useful for the work, uh, for the future cooperation. And I hope. And I hope that this kind of uh, the activity will be uh, done, will be done again and again, you know, for the benefit of young generation. So thank you very much for the organizer and for everyone, uh, panelists and all participants. And I wish all the best and very fruitful today of our meeting. Thank you. Anthropologist Diego Prieto, would you like to give us some words? Yes, of course, I will be glad, Fernando. First of all, I thank you very much for this invitation. Even though I was traveling precisely from Oaxaca, which is the state, the region of the Mexican Republic where Fernando lives and where he has the collective tequio, la buena impresión, así, that has been a great propeller of this first colloquium of archaeology and restoration mexico cambodia which i am sure that will not be the only one but will be the first of a series of colloquiums and encounters that will increasingly be more intense and fruitful and very useful for the knowledge of the past and the present of these two great peoples Mexico and Cambodia. I greet you especially for Dr. Sakona, Her Excellency Minister of Culture of the Kingdom of Cambodia. And I also greet Dr. Hampu, General Director of the National Authority Apsara for the protection and safeguarding of Angkor and of the region of Angkor Pat in the Kingdom of Cambodia. Undoubtedly, Mexico and Cambodia share a set of circumstances that brings, bring us together. We both are countries that were seated on lands that were cradled to native civilizations that were origin and of the domestication of natural and vegetable species that fed entire regions in the planet civilizations that are still present and alive, but that still have to leave behind a past of colonialism, of domain, and of invisibility by the centers of power in the world. Both territories, both countries, both nations have suffered the invades of colonialism and we have received interventions by foreign countries which have been very complicated before the ones that we have needed to defend our sovereignty and independence. Precisely in this year, Mexico is commemorating 200 years of its independence from the Kingdom of Spain and the shaping of our country as an independent and sovereign one, but that along the 19th century and even in the first decades of the 20th, suffered different foreign interventions which put in risk its sovereignty and the capability to decide its destiny. Both countries have also suffered wars and internal conflicts, and we are building countries 
seeking for a better future, for a peaceful life, and for sister relationships with the other countries of the world. It is very important that this colloquium be the starting point of the strengthening of relations in terms of culture, friendship, and the cooperation in general with the broader people of Cambodia. I also greet the Mexican colleagues who joined this colloquium, Dr. Sergio Gomez Chavez, who will begin with the first conference, the master conference, the Dr. Raul Barrera of the program of urban archaeology, who is working precisely in the recovery of the memory of Mexico Tenochtitlan, capital city of the Mexica state of the Triple Alliance Empire, that precisely 500, 500 years ago fell under the embate of the Spaniards and its indigenous allies. We will also have with us our dear colleague Nelly Robles, who works intensely in all the Oaxaca region, especially in Montelban and Atzompa. Likewise, Guillermo de Anda from National Geographic and collaborator of INA, who has been working in the recovery of the cultural and natural values of the Great Maya Aquifer in the Maya Peninsula of Yucatan. Undoubtedly, Jareli Haidar, colleague of the UNAM expert in science materials who has collaborated in the definition of conservation and restoration strategies of archaeological property. And we also greet the Cambodian colleagues who will enrich us with their experiences in the task of research of archaeology and conservation of archaeological sites and monuments, in particular Angkor, the park of the Kingdom of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Especially Pem San Juan, Sun Ting Kin, Arya Karit, and also Q Chan. And of course, to the great promoter of this first colloquium, our dear Keria Sun. I trust that this first colloquium will be the starting point of a large collaboration between the archaeology sciences, the conservation and restoration, and anthropology of Cambodia and Mexico. Very good luck. We thank Master Fernando Aceves for his welcome words. And now, before the authorities of both countries, I am glad to share with you a brief CV of Dr. Sergio Gomez Chavez. Dr. Sergio Gomez Chavez is director of the Ciudadela Project and the Tlalocan Project in charge of the exploration of the tunnel under the Temple of the Feathered Serpent in Teotihuacan. He graduated from the National School of Anthropology and History. 
He is full-time research professor at the National Institute of Anthropology and History. He has published almost 100 articles in Mexico and abroad that address aspects on the writing system and language in Teotihuacan, specialized craft production, spatial organization of the neighborhoods, the ball game, ethnic groups residing in Teotihuacan, and the protection of the archaeological and historical heritage of Mexico. For several years, he was a professor at the National School of Anthropology and History. In 2005 and 6, he made academic and research stays at La Sorbonne Paris 4 and the École des Études en Sciences Sociales in France. Since 2002, he has directed the Ciudadela Project and the Tlalocan Project, consisting of the exploration of the tunnel under the Temple of the Feathered Serpent in Teotihuacan. In 2005, he received the Teotihuacan Prize for the Best Research. In 2015, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences presented him with a Field Discovery Award, award for the world's greatest archaeological discovery. He has lectured at museums and universities in the United States, France, Germany, Japan, Denmark, Puerto Rico, Spain, Canada, El Salvador, and China. He has been guest professor and lecturer at La Sorbonne University, Harvard University, University of Copenhagen, Aichi University, Japan, and the David Rockefeller Center, among others. Welcome, Dr. Sergio Gomez Chavez. Please, you may begin. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mexico. Good morning, Cambodia. First of all, I want to thank Fernando Aceves and the Collective La Buena Impresión for the invitation to take part in this first colloquium of archaeology and restoration. I also want to thank to the authorities of Cambodia and Mexico, to the authorities of the National Institute of Anthropology and History. I am going to share my screen and my presentation will be about archaeology and conservation in Teotihuacan, one of the most important archaeological sites and most impressive that we have in Mexico. I have been working in Teotihuacan for over 40 years, and along my presentation, I want to try to express which is the feeling and the emotion, and which is the commitment that archaeologists in Mexico have to work in a place like this, an outstanding site that has lots of possibilities for research in terms of archaeology. First of all, I need to locate for our friends in Cambodia and for those who are far from here where Teotihuacan is located. Teotihuacan is located on the central plateau, plateau of the Mexican Republic and it is 45 kilometers away from the, what was the great city of Mexico. Each year, millions of tourists arrive to Teotihuacan and visit some of the main monuments. On the image we can see on the left side in the upper part the Pyramid of the Moon and the Pyramid of the Sun in the center. These are two very important monuments that we have in this site. Each year, millions of visitors arrive to this place and they come with different kinds of intentions from what we, the archaeologists, do. That's why the National Institute of Anthropology and History intends to present an outline in which we can present all the investigation on this important site. I must point out that it was here in Teotihuacan where Don Carlos de Sigüenza y Góngora, the first Mexican historian who did archaeological diggings, the first one made in the American continent, was a digging developed in the year of 1675. In 1675, until the end of the 19th century, many other travelers arrived to Teotihuacan and left beautiful images of what they considered or what they could see. Evidently, these are romantic images and descriptions which were very far from what we know today about this site. There is a beautiful image of painter Jose Maria Velasco, a very important Mexican painter, painted towards 1878 with 
very well describe the perception that people used to have on this place. And on this canvas, we can see the depiction of the Sun Pyramid. Around 1865, an architect who was also a spy for the government of the Second Republic of Napoleon III arrived to Teotihuacan and is probably the one who did the first archaeological diggings in an extensive way on this site. Unfortunately, all his records, all his file, and the, gen the information generated by him that some people that have studied his biography was made of thousands of drawings and writings were lost when he got back to France after being for some months in Mexico. It was in 1895 when the official archaeological diggings began in Teotihuacan. A Mexican archaeologist would be the first to carry out the exploration on the Sun Pyramid in Teotihuacan. This exploration was entrusted by the then Mexican president Porfirio Diaz to commemorate the first centenary of the independence of Mexico. However, today the knowledge we have on Teotihuacan is very far from those romantic images and from those first impressions of those who began to work in this place. The city of Teotihuacan is recognized as one of the most complex societies that ever existed in Mesoamerican territory. And as we are going to see, Teotihuacan is not only what tourists can visit each year, the millions of tourists, tourists that arrive each year. It's not the, just the pyramids of the sun and the moon, but it's thousands of archaeological complexes that form this wonderful city. In this place, given its importance and given the relevancy to the investigation, scientists and researchers from different disciplines, not only archaeologists or anthropologists or ethnologists, even ecologists, have applied a wide range of theories and even in this site, different methodologies have been tested. Archaeologists have used different techniques trying to contrast hypotheses that intend to provide explanations about this complex society. Today, archaeologists are using new technologies to have a more scientific and analytic perception of the materials that we have found when we are digging. And this allows somehow to reinforce many of the ideas and the interpretations and hypotheses that we have posed. New technologies allow us precisely to have a deeper knowledge of what reality was in Teotihuacan. This way, in case of the restoration, in the field of restoration, we see that different methodologies have been used and diverse materials have been applied. Those devoted to this task have changed and have applied the different trends of restoration, which have been since the total reconstruction, as we can see in this image, in an ensemble known as the Quetzal Butterfly Palace, to other works developed at present time, in which it is sought to have the least intervention as possible. Here we can see how, up to the year 60s, works of total reconstruction of buildings were made. Today, these are works that are forbidden at international level and restorers and archaeologists try to avoid reconstruction and we are trying to use similar materials or close materials to the originals because we understand that reconstruction of buildings affects them because they lose 
this dimension and the historical character of a monument or of what an archaeological site would be. Now, we can ask ourselves what's the importance of our Teotihuacan for archaeology. This is fundamental because many investigators recognize in this place the opportunity to investigate different aspects around the origin of social classes, how the state arose, the ways of government, and the role of institutions. Archaeologists and other researchers of social sciences are interested in Teotihuacan because we can investigate different aspects about the production systems, their impact in demography and environment. More than in Nedio, any other place, Teotihuacan is a key site to undertake and study urbanism and the built space as a social product. Archaeologists are also interested in studying the systems of religious thinking and the worldview, not only in Teotihuacan, but also of the Mesoamerican cultures in general. Studies devoted to the understanding and to physical anthropology are very important because they have allowed us to understand the conditions of life of the population, the impact in health and disease that people suffered and which were the patterns of consumption. Finally, archaeologists recognize that Teotihuacan, given its size and complexity and the ancienty, is a reference for understanding the processes that led to the development of humanity itself. To locate on time, we can point out that Teotihuacan began around the year 400 before Christ. By that time is when Small communities arrived to populate the valley of Teotihuacan. However, between the years 100 and 150 of our age and the 550 or 600 of our age is when Teotihuacan reached its maximum development in apogee. Around the 750 of our era, Teotihuacan suffered problems of social and economic nature, which let make the city to be abandoned and destroyed probably by its own inhabitants. Today, we have a map of the former urban complex, and each of these small squares that you can see on the image represent the different architectural ensembles of the city. A city that had a length of all around 23 square kilometers and was made up by different architectural ensembles. Here we see the place of the pyramids of the sun and the moon that joined together with the citadel and one of the most important complexes that used to be the city market, the main market, and they were united by a large roadway or processional path. We see different quarters, like the Maya Quarter and other quarters used by other ethnic groups. Hydraulic works of monumental character were built for the management of different waters, sewer systems, and that gives us an idea of the knowledge people of Tatiwakan had around sewage systems. They had an impressive drainage, and they also had a water supply system for the daily life use and for all the activities which was carried out through different kinds of wells. Here in the image, we can see how these constructions represented on this map maintain a spatial orientation, which is a 15 degrees, 17 minutes deviated to the east-north. When we speak that all the constructions in the city had a deviation, we don't mean to say that the Teotihuacans made a mistake, but they built the city and maintained this orientation so that the entire city could work as an astronomical clock. From the Pyramid of the Sun, we can consider that it is the largest astronomical clock that humankind ever built a long history. 
We know that the city was organized spatially and politically in quarters. Although we still know that since the beginnings it was formed by different ethno-linguistic groups. The city didn't have the same shape and dimensions always. It changed. Since the beginning of our era, we can see how the city went modifying and growing as the population grew. At the beginning of our era, the city would probably have 17 square kilometers and probably up to 50,000 inhabitants. The Metepec phase, which is one of the final stages, the city ended having 22.5 square kilometers and probably between 150 and 170,000 inhabitants. For us, these are small numbers because our cities are very large, having millions of inhabitants, but in that time, very few cities or settlements, not only in the American continent, but in the world, reached to have such a large population and concentrated in one same space. In this image, you can see some of the three main architectural complexes of the ensemble of the Tihuacan. And here I am pointing out at one of the main waterworks, which is the Canal of San Juan, an impressive work. We see the roadway of the dead. In the upper part, we can see the area that comprised the Pyramid of the Moon, then the complex of the Sun Pyramid, and more to the south, the complex of the Citadel below the San Juan River. This is an image of the Moon Pyramid, a building having 154 meters per side and reaching a height of 45 meters. After many explorations and works developed in the year 60, some of the buildings have been discovered, buildings around this complex, and there are still many other buildings to be explored. The architectural ensemble of the Sun Pyramid represented the main building. And we have here a large basement having 110 meters per side and a height of 65 meters. Many buildings around these would have shaped the architectural complex, which is one of the three main that Teotihuacan had. Finally, to the south, we find the architectural complex of the citadel having in the center the temple of the feathered serpent, a building that has been given different interpretations a long time, but today we think that it was a building that was dedicated to commemorate the began of the mythical time or the beginning of the calendar and the cycle of days. This is one of the most emblematic and important buildings that we have, not only in Teotihuacan, but also in Mexico. Teotihuacan was the largest exchange center of production and consumption of all kinds of merchandises in Mesoamerica. Objects such as these that we can see were produced in the different workshops, hundreds of workshops that the city had and that generated an impressive wealth thanks to which it was possible to achieve the construction of those large buildings such as the pyramids of the sun and the moon which have more than 1 million of cubic meters in volume, uh, according to different calculations. Archaeologists have recognized that the obsidian had a fundamental role in the economy of Teotihuacan. There are more than 400 workshops that were 
discovered which were devoted to produce obsidian and there are many deposits of obsidian near Teotihuacan that surely were controlled by the people of Teotihuacan and at local and regional level the distribution and exchange of these resources made in the city was very important in terms of economy for the city. Something that is very surprising for us is the scarce or limited technology that people in Teotihuacan and the Mesoamerican cultures used, where most of the tools were made of bone and stone. We must recognize that it was until very many time after Teotihuacan disappeared that metals were used in Mesoamerica. But during the apogee of Teotihuacan and other cultures, the tools were basically made of bone, stone, and wood. And metals were not used during the pre-Hispanic time. The scarce technological development of these cultures was compensated with a useful use of the workforce, which is one of the explanations that we have, how with a so limited technology they could reach such important advances as those we can see. We know the construction process in terms of architecture, the volumes for the for building the volumes of the pyramids or the pyramidal basements. For example, on this scheme, we can see the process that was followed, like forming a kinds of boxes that were filled with sand and stones to give the volumes and shapes to the different basements. Here we recognize some of the features of the architecture, the monumental architecture of these basements some of the main elements that are characteristics of this kind of monuments are the talud and the boards here we see the inclined part is the talud and here we see some moldings marking an inlaid space and the stairs that allow the access to the upper part and these stairs were delimited by elements called alfardas the function of these basement pyramids was to support on the upper part a temple a temple or probably a chamber that was used to keep the statues of the deities and in some cases probably were used as chambers for high rank people architecture is very important and characteristic of Teotihuacan because there we can see the combination of the ku, which were religious spaces with shrines, combined with other spaces devoted for the daily life and for other activities. That's why architecture in Teotihuacan is so attractive and interesting for those who studied the shaping of the space, not only in terms of architecture itself, but as a result of a social product. In terms of symbology, the pyramids and the pyramidal basements also represent mountains, sacred mountains that in their inside have symbolically all those elements and materials that are needed by human beings or living beings for their sustenance. Inside these basements are kept all the food the supplies and all those material elements and strengths that allow life. That's why architecture is closely bound to the concepts of the world view and the magical thought, not only in the Teotihuacan, but in general in ancient Mesoamerican cultures. We have very interesting information and very complete about architecture and the characteristics of architectural elements in the dwellings 
and dwelling in symbols in Teotihuacan. We will always find open spaces limited by closed spaces and spaces that allow the circulation towards other architectural units where the same pattern is being repeated and therefore we will always find open and closed spaces and access between them. That's why when looking at the maps of the architectural ensembles we can understand and it would seem easy to explore this type of settlement because that way we can know what is beyond a patio or a square and we will always find closed sp spaces around these open spaces that were sources of illumination and ventilation. These are images of the dwelling units, the domestic ensembles that were used by families, families that we cannot know how many members they had or how many spaces each family could have used, but we can understand that each space, each construction, each ensemble is reproducing inside elements of their cosmogony. Each space had in its center a small shrine and somehow they gave the sacral aspect to the spaces used in daily life. These are images of other architectural ensembles so that you can see some of the characteristics and something that is distinctive for the dwelling ensembles is that some of them were decorated with mural painting. Today we recognize that mural painting was for exclusive use of elite groups and mural painting was only used in dwelling for elite groups or for public buildings. It must have been impressive to visit a place like this and here we see a reconstruction made some years ago which in fact doesn't really look like the reconstructions that we can see today being made with the recent technologies but I wanted to show it to you so that you can get an idea of the perception or how would it feel to enter into these spaces where we can see the patios and how in the corners and in other spaces we can find access to other closed spaces that were decorated with diverse motifs all of them always religious motifs which refer to the groups that occupied these spaces and that surely had the function of reinforcing the identity of those who inhabited these spaces. Something surprising in Teotihuacan is an element that is known as the architectural superposition. On the lower part, we can see the remains of one stage and how it was destroyed to overlap another one or to build the new stage of the same building with different motifs, sometimes with the same dimensions, but with different iconographical elements and different decoration. That's why we are surprised with Teotihuacan, because for nearly 600 years, people in Teotihuacan didn't stop developing an intense building activity and we must consider that there were no animals to carry materials and neither they used the wheel to carry materials. Transportation of millions of cubic meters of materials for construction was made by people. They carried on their back all the materials using a device called Mecapal. Here we can see, just to point out, how the buildings in their interior have different superpositions. In the case of the Moon Pyramid, the archaeologist Ruben Cabrera 
recognize that there are different superpositions and in fact the one that we can visit or see when we go to the Tihuacan would correspond to the sixth superposition because of the last one, the seventh one, there is not much to see. Here is a map of a quarter that I had a chance to explore along with Ruben Cabrera. And after these findings, we knew that the city was not organized in quarters, but that the different elements of the quarters that would have shaped the urban complex of Teotihuacan would be. Each one had a public square and institutional buildings and other for government activities, the dwellings used by the elite classes, which were decorated with mural painting, and the housing for the population in general, population that was devoted to the production of different handcrafts. We know that for the Patlachiki phase between the 200 and the beginning of our era, the Tihuacan had a population of around 40,000 people. In this part, I am placing the Tihuacan, and in that time, there was another city south of the basin of Mexico with which the Tihuacan competed in different aspects. The Tihuacan in that time was just part of a network of economical and social bonds that allowed the exchange and the distribution not only of goods but also of ideas and of maintaining other kind of relationships. However, some centuries later, Teotihuacan, located on that spot, is located on the center of a network, a large network, because Cuicuilco, which is found in the south of the basin, was buried when the Ixtle volcano erupted. And this way, Teotihuacan, and we can say that its economical success was given by the integration of this large network of economical and social bonds that evidently brought many benefits in terms of economy and political benefits for Teotihuacan. For many centuries, Teotihuacan sought to have different resources from different places. That's why they established different routes for the supply of different resources that could be used for the consumption of the population residing in the city. I must say that the Tihuacan is a small valley where there are very few resources. Most of the food to feed the population in Teotihuacan was brought from different places. There are cal calculations that suppose that the city had between 175 and 200,000 inhabitants, but the valley of Teotihuacan could only sustain in terms of food production only 40,000 people in such a way that most of the food that was consumed in the city was brought from other places. And in farther places like the Maya Zone, the people of Teotihuacan were, went in search of resources used by elite classes. In the 378, this is a very important date because Teotihuacan invaded the Maya area and conquered one of the most important cities that then existed in the Maya area, Tikal. Epigraphists have pointed out that a military called Siyekka, which means burning fire went to different Maya sites before arriving to Pica to Tikal 
One year later, a very important character called Jax Nunajin, first alligator, who was son of a governor of Teotihuacan, was appointed as governor of this city. By any chance, the first ruler of this city had died, and it is said in different texts that he had entered into the water. And this character who arrived from Teotihuacan took the place of the ruler, conquering this important place. I will rapidly say that for a long time ago, it was thought that in Teotihuacan there was no re human sacrifice, but today we recognize that human sacrifice was a very extended practice, practiced at individual level in the domestic spaces, in the quarters, and there were also mass human sacrifices in which probably most of the population would have take part as spectators of the sacrifices. And in these sacrifices, many sacrificed people took part. They were sacrificed in some ceremonies or rituals. And thanks to the study of the burials, human burials, we can recognize the characteristic way how people was buried. And we can identify who were from Teotihuacan because of the way of burying the dead. In Teotihuacan, they were buried bent and we have found lots of skeletons from babies and this way we can see that the population reproduced with a high reproduction index but that many children were dying mainly because of problems at the birth time and by diseases probably gastrointestinal illnesses and other diseases. There were different practices like placing cinnabar on the bodies as a symbol of status. Thanks to the studies of physical anthropology, we know some of the physical features of the people in Teotihuacan, men, were like 160 high and women 140 and among other characteristics we know that they practiced the skull deformation. This is a reconstruction made by Dr. Linda Manzanilla some years ago and this is very illustrative because it allows us to have an idea of how would people of Teotihuacan can look like and which were the physical traits of people from Teotihuacan. Based on the anthropophysical studies, these reconstructions can be made. Nowadays, we can use different resources that can be more precise. But finally, all of these give us an idea of how people of Teotihuacan could have looked like in that time. I think that reconstruction is not very far because now we can see here a picture of a colleague of us from Teotihuacan and I think that the reconstruction made by Dr. Manzanilla is very accurate and close to what a Teotihuacan could have looked like. For a long time it was doubted that Teotihuacan had a writing system but we could confirmed when working with Master Ruben Cabrera, we could discover a series of glyphs that confirmed that Teotihuacan used and had a writing system that lasted over many centuries and that probably was very similar to that utilized in codexes for later times. Until here we have made a, a trip around Teotihuacan and what we know about it and we would obviously need more time to speak about all that we know and all the knowledge that has been generated, especially in the last 50 or 60 years in which research has been developed in a more systematized way using other techniques. 
Now I am going to speak about the exploration I am carrying out for around 13 years in the tunnel below the Feathered Serpent Temple. This research began because this emblematic building of the Feathered Serpent Temple started to show some damages and we needed to pose the problem and try to identify some of the causes that were provoking the decay in the building. So together with different colleagues and specialists, specialists in different disciplines from Mexico and abroad, we analyzed the problem and trying to find a solution to this problem. Being working in the attention to the conservation problems on this temple, on October 2 of the year 2003, there appeared a hole next to the temple of the feathered serpent and I descended tied to a rope and then I discovered that there was a tunnel running below the temple. We have been working for 12 years of exploration, continuous exploration in the most systematic way because we knew that we had the chance to find very important elements. And this has also given us the chance to carry out the exploration of this important architectural element and to utilize different technologies only as resources that have favored and the exploration of this important element. For 12 years of continuous work, we have need to adapt different strategies to carry out to a good end this exploration and finally the intention is to provide an explanation, a scientific explanation of all that we have found and about the meaning that the Tiwakan people gave to this underground channel. In these 12 years we have found, for example, here is the space through which I descended, we couldn't enter more deeper into the shaft until I proposed to dig to find the main entrance and then along these years we have advanced meter by meter, centimeter to centimeter, discovering many offerings and many objects which have given us a unique experience and that give testimony to the work that we have developed at the National Institute of Anthropology and History. The merit is not only mine, but of all the team that has worked and collaborated with me, and of all the researchers that shape the National Institute of Anthropology and History. This is a sample of the thousands of objects that we have found and that attest the richness and the importance of this archaeological exploration. Specialists in different materials collaborate with me analyzing and studying the different materials. Here we also have the collaboration of a very important team of restorers who have been devoted to the recovery of the different objects that we have found during the exploration. Incredibly, we have recovered more than 20,000 different seeds in perfect state of conservation. We have cocoa, we have bean, maize, and many botanic material that will help us to understand different aspects about the environment in that time and about the botanical resources that were utilized with ritual ends. And in the case of cocoa, some of the materials that were imported from far places. We have thousands or maybe hundreds and thousands 
probably of bone remains of different animals that were deposited in the tunnel. Some of them were furs. We have only found some parts that corroborate that furs were deposited there. We have remains of insects deposited in boxes like box and we can also see a small sample how we found hundreds of snails and many other objects that are in perfect state of conservation finally when we reached the end of the tunnel we found two extraordinary sculptures which interpretation we are working on Although we have idea of the symbolism and meaning of these magnificent sculptures that, as you can see, three are depictions of women dressed with a skirt and with a kind of clock called Quechquemetl in Mexico, and the male character, which is smaller than the sculptures of women, depicted in greenstone. My initial theory is that these are the representation in stone of the ancestors founders of the Teotihuacan because all of them are carrying different packs where they brought all the materials that were utilized for magic and divination. These persons had the gift of divination and that way they could locate the sacred place where they needed to place the three stones to raise the first shrine and where the sedentary life must have begun. I also want to point out that this work developed is not only mine, but it's from a large work of collaborators. These are technicians in restoration youths that have been trained and that take part in the exploration and each of them is assigned to a specific task. Finally, I have been asked to speak a little bit around about why I am an archaeologist and I want to tell you that I arrived to the Tiwakan when I was 19 years old and today I am 60 years old and I've been two-thirds of my life working in this impressive and magnificent place. Before arriving and to the Tiwakan and being an archaeologist, I had the chance to study psychology. And when I had my first encounter with archaeology, I realized that we were fine that I was finally dealing with similar aspects of the although the way to face them was different. So now we are trying to understand aspects of worldview and thinking and the form of acting and being of the people, of the people from before and the people of today. And this way, I consider myself as an archaeologist, a very fortunate person and very lucky because I have the chance of entering or having access to things that give me the opportunity to understand and to deepen into our past and to understand the behavior of pues, human beings. Thank you very much. Son varias, eh, para el Dr. Sergio Gómez. Entonces las vamos a, a replicar ahí en voz alta, haciéndonos el portavoz ahí de, nos, de quienes nos están escuchando y quienes están participando a este panel. Eh, primera pregunta. Eh, de parte de, de, de Francisca, este, la pregunta es, viene siendo Francisca, para hacer este completo, completo Francisca Martanet, pregunta, ¿existen más túneles y hay una relación entre el túnel de la pirámide de Quetzalcóatl con las cuevas de la zona? Existe bajo la pirámide del sol otro túnel descubierto en los años 70, tiene las mismas dimensiones que el túnel que que nosotros hemos explorado. Sin embargo, uh, la diferencia es de que cuando se descubrió en los años 70, eh, prácticamente estaba vacío. 
alguien había entrado y probablemente extraído muchos materiales importantes que debieron haber sido depositados ahí. Tanto el túnel de la pirámide del sol como el túnel de la serpiente emplumada, mi propuesta es que debieron haber sido originalmente depósitos funerarios. Debieron haber funcionado como tumbas de alguien muy importante, probablemente algunos de los gobernantes más antiguos de Teotihuacán y por alguna razón eh, fueron eh, saqueados. En el caso del túnel de la pirámide del sol, eh, no tenemos gran, muchos más elementos, tenemos muy pocos materiales que se lograron recuperar. En el caso del templo de la serpiente, del túnel bajo el templo de la serpiente emplumada, sabemos que los teotihuacanos ingresaron y sacaron algo muy importante, algo muy pesado del interior. Desafortunadamente jamás vamos a poder saber qué fue lo que sacaron, aunque mi hipótesis es de que sacaron los restos probablemente de alguna persona contenida en una urna. No lo sabemos. Hay otros túneles en Teotihuacán, otra, otras eh, oquedades, eh, pero no, no mantienen relación con estos. Estos tienen una orientación muy específica y se encuentran bajo los dos templos más importantes o, o edificios más importantes, que es el de la pirámide del sol y de la luna. La orientación de este a oeste o de oeste a este está marcando precisamente esta esta vinculación que sabemos existía entre la forma como se concebía el inframundo, el inframundo eh, al cual se accede desde el oeste y tiene la parte más importante en el lado este. Por eso nosotros cuando iniciamos la exploración sabíamos o habíamos eh, postulado como hipótesis que al final del túnel en el lado este debíamos encontrar eh, la tumba de alguien muy importante o una ofrenda que refiriera precisamente la importancia del lugar, la importancia sagrada eh, y simbólica de este lugar. Muchas gracias por esta respuesta. Pasamos a la segunda pregunta este, que viene siendo, bueno, más bien ahí de experiencias la, profesionales, laborales. ¿Ha tenido ahí la posibilidad de realizar exploraciones en otras partes del mundo? Y este, ¿dónde ha permanecido más tiempo fuera de México? Eh, toda mi vida profesional, todo el, de, el desarrollo de mi vida profesional he realizado precisamente en Teotihuacán. Llegué a Teotihuacán estudian, siendo estudiante de, de la carrera de psicología y por azares del destino eh, me ofrecieron un día un trabajo en este lugar. Yo era encargado, me ofrecieron el, el ser encargado de una eh, pequeña biblioteca con formar una pequeña biblioteca y, y fue muy interesante porque eso me dio la oportunidad de leer muchísimo. Mi trabajo era eh, conseguir todo el material bibliográfico, los libros para los arqueólogos que trabajaban en ese momento en un proyecto muy importante que se llevaba a cabo en Teotihuacán y mi trabajo era leer y pasarles los síntesis, los resúmenes a los arqueólogos y entonces por esa razón pues eh, poco a poco me fui involucrando en la arqueología hasta que un día uh, abandoné eh, el est mis estudios en psicología y me dediqué a la arqueología. Siempre he trabajado en Teotihuacán, no he trabajado en otro lado, me gustaría eh, trabajar en Camboya por supuesto, es un lugar que visité alguna vez y me, me impresionó eh, sería in, in, muy importante trabajar en otros lugares porque eh, es una manera de nosotros los arqueólogos de tener elementos de comparación. Yo creo que ya es muy interesante saber un poquito el, el origen de todo esto, ¿no? de saber de cómo se puede desarrollar una carrera de arqueólogo, aun cuando uno haya estudiado otra, otra cosa antes. Muchas gracias, Sergio. Eh, tercera pregunta. Ahí sí, regresando a, al túnel, ¿qué fecha le han dado a las esculturas que se encontraron en el túnel? ¿Las ofrendas son contemporáneas? Eh, algo, algo que nos ha sorprendido es de que eh, todos estos depósitos se realizaron en un periodo de tiempo muy corto. Eh, nosotros tenemos fechamientos 
eh, realizados por medio, obtenidos por medio del análisis de carbono 14 y la fecha más antigua que tenemos es 70 después, eh, 70 de nuestra era. De tal manera que eh, la construcción del túnel debió haber sido hacia el inicio de nuestra era. El túnel permaneció utilizándose por cerca de 200 años, 200, 250 años, hasta que finalmente los teotihuacanos deciden clausurarlo y nadie más volvió a entrar ahí hasta que nosotros tuvimos la suerte de encontrar el tiro que nos permitió el acceso a este importante elemento. Entonces, son las fechas que tenemos, tenemos que seguir trabajando pero uh, las, las esculturas y todos estos uh, elementos uh, depositados al final del túnel debieron haber sido colocados entre el año 100 y 150 después de, de, de nuestra era. Gracias por la precisión. Eh, pues ahí no veo más preguntas ahí que me van llegando, entonces voy a hacer una pregunta ya este, también estima de carácter motivacional, ¿no? ya que se puesto el, el tema. Vemos ahí que la, la situación a, a nivel global eh, debido al COVID ha complicado muchísimo todo lo que es la, la exploración arqueológica, lo que es el trabajo arqueológico. Eh, México no es exento este, de, de esos problemas. ¿Cuáles serían las recomendaciones que podíamos hacer a, a un joven que quisiera empezar una carrera de arqueología este, hoy día en México y en Camboya quizás? Este, ¿Cuáles serían ahí la, los mejores consejos que podríamos dar a esos chavos? No sé si puedo yo dar un consejo, pero eh, se requiere de mucha pasión, mucha paciencia y sobre todo mucho estudio, mucha lectura eh, para poder eh, tener elementos eh, que nos permitan brindar explicaciones científicas plausibles de lo que los arqueólogos eh, vamos descubriendo. Eh, sobre todo in, el interés eh, por algún tipo de uh, material o algún aspecto en particular. Eh, he dirigido algunas tesis eh, de estudiantes de licenciatura y lo primero que les digo es, eh, yo no te voy a dar el tema, tú tienes que buscar y saber qué es lo que te gusta, qué es lo que te apasiona y qué es en, el, en dónde podrías tú, eh, de qué manera podrías tú colaborar para entender mejor un aspecto o resolver un problema. Entonces, eh, pues creo que eh, los jóvenes en México tienen mucha oportunidad para desarrollar un trabajo eh, en el ámbito de la arqueología, que desafortunadamente las posibilidades de encontrar trabajo a veces son difíciles, pero, pero hay un campo muy amplio para eh, el desarrollo de la investigación arqueológica. Muchas gracias, Sergio Gómez. Este, voy a pedir a, pues, a nuestros panelistas presentes que vayan prendiendo sus cámaras y vamos a pedir al antropólogo este, Diego Prieto, director del Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia, y uh, pues, a la honorable ministra de Cultura eh, de Camboya, la, la, la señora Ferun Saconay, que, que también está ahí prendiendo su, su, su cámara, para eventualmente hacer este, unos comentarios acerca de la presentación del, del doctor Sergio Gómez. Por favor, adelante. Empezamos quizás con el, con el antropólogo este, Diego Prieto. Muy buenas noches, pues eh, ha sido un gusto escuchar, como siempre, a mi queridísimo colega Sergio Gómez, eh, que yo creo que representa de manera muy clara el inmenso trabajo que lleva adelante el Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia para el estudio, el cuidado, la protección legal, la divulgación y el disfrute social de nuestro patrimonio arqueológico, histórico y antropológico. El instituto es una gran institución creada hace poco más de 82 años por el Estado mexicano y que tiene mucho que ver con la eh, intención de recuperar en las grandes aportaciones de las civilizaciones que florecieron en nuestro territorio la explicación de mucho de lo que tiene que ver con nuestra diversidad cultural, lingüística y étnica. La necesidad de que México recupere esta condición pluricultural 
que muchas veces fue opacada por el colonialismo, por la segregación, por la dominación extranjera y por eh, visiones que resultaban culturalmente excluyentes. Y en ese sentido, yo recuperaría lo que planteó Sergio. Es muy importante que podamos hacer intercambios académicos en terreno y que eh, los colegas de Camboya puedan venir a México a conocer los trabajos que se llevan a cabo en Teotihuacán, en el Templo Mayor, en Monte Albán y Atzompa, en, la, en el área oaxaqueña en general, pero también en el sureste, donde ahora estamos llevando a cabo un trabajo inmenso de salvamento arqueológico y de investigación regional de la arqueología y la antropología eh, del área maya mexicana, a resultas de este gran proyecto del gobierno mexicano, que es el que se ha denominado el Tren Maya. En ese sentido, los hallazgos de Teotihuacán son verdaderamente sorprendentes. Teotihuacán es un área fundamental para entender la arqueología mexicana y para entender los desarrollos que se, culturales en toda el área del antiplano mexicano. Eh, Sergio habló de cómo desde el siglo XVII empieza en la Nueva España la inquietud por hacer estudios de esta vieja ciudad mesoamericana, pero también habría que reconocer que ya desde el periodo posclásico hacia los siglos XIV y XV de nuestra era, los mexicas van a Teotihuacán, que es una ciudad ya virtualmente desocupada, aunque seguía habiendo este, pobladores en mucho menor densidad y, um, y trabajan ahí la idea de que ese es el lugar en donde surgieron sus dioses, porque los mexicas necesitaban un discurso de legitimación para po poder construir su hegemonía en la cuenca de México y más allá en la gran parte del territorio mesoamericano. En ese sentido, este, me parece fundamental que recuperemos este vínculo porque no quiero desconocer que en mucho la arqueología y la antropología de México se desarrollaron, eh, digamos, y muy imbuidos de la necesidad de recuperar la afirmación nacional. Pero no podemos negar el diálogo con las demás culturas y con las demás comunidades arqueológicas, antropológicas y, eh, por supuesto, las instituciones que se ocupan de la conservación y restauración del patrimonio cultural en otras naciones. De manera que el diálogo con Camboya me parece fundamental. Sin duda, en Camboya y en un sentido más amplio, en el sureste asiático, vamos a encontrar muchas claves para poder hacer estudios comparados de los desarrollos civilizatorios en eh, estos ámbitos que constituyen las cunas de civilizaciones originarias. Saludo entonces eh, mucho este primer coloquio, México-Camboya, Arqueología y Restauración, y hago votos para que siga produciendo muy buenos resultados como el que nos ha ofrecido Sergio Gómez con esta muy brillante conferencia. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, este, antropólogo. Este, vamos a, a pasar la palabra a, a, a la honorable ministra de Cultura de, de Camboya, a, a la señora Ferón Sacona, si quiere hacer ahí unos comentarios este, finales. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like just to say that It is a very big and interesting work, research, research work, very valuable for sharing, you know, uh, history, you know, uh, methodology, and also the current situation of uh, Mexico. And, uh, you know, we are also with our colleague from Cambodia. So that Honestly, you know, I'm not a archaeologist, but I follow it very interesting because uh, uh, 
when we talk to the past, we, we just uh, in in my heart, in my head, uh, I wonder how it was built. You know, uh, the theory. Mexico, the uncle, you know, it, it was imagining our ancestral. So that uh, even actually a lot of research uh, of, uh, work, work very hard, but we cannot find every and every question and cannot do answer for the work done by our ancestral. So that I encourage you and very uh, uh, grat grat grateful for, for your work. And also, as I say again, very important for our joint together experience, sharing experience between Mexico and, uh, and Cambodia. Uh, they are this, uh, almost the same uh, history, the same civil, uh, similar civilization. So that uh, it is my work, I would like to say at the end. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, señora ministra. Muchas gracias, señor eh, director Diego Prieto, por sus palabras. Pues yo le voy a pedir a, a, a todos nuestros panelistas ahí presenten, por favor, presentes, por favor, que, que, que prendan ahí sus cámaras. Este, tenemos ahí que, que tomar un pequeño recuerdo de esta, primera, de esta primera conferencia que impartió el doctor Sergio Gómez Chávez. Eh, conferencia inaugural ahí de, de este primer coloquio eh, binacional eh, de, de arqueología y, y, y restauración. Este, y bueno, también invitarlos eh, a, pues a seguir la programación de este coloquio. Tenemos una segunda sesión que va a estar muy, muy interesante el día, el día de mañana. Va a estar con nosotros la doctora Nelly Robles, que eh, fue en su momento directora de la zona arqueológica de Monte Albán y este, pues, eh, también eh, integrante del Consejo Nacional de Arqueología. Eh, y bueno, nos va a hablar entonces de, de, de cómo ser arqueóloga en Oaxaca en su momento. Este, entonces, este, queden ahí, este, quédense un tantito ahí los panelistas. Este, Fernando, no sé si quieres ahí dar unas palabras ahí para cerrar esta primera sesión. Adelante. Agradecer a, a todos los participantes eh, que pues, están aquí con nosotros y pues bueno seguimos con la idea no nosotros somos en realidad somos pintores éramos un oficio que era muy importante para, para la arqueología y pues se ha separado un poco por las cuestiones del, de la tecnología pero existe una hermandad y yo creo que tanto la labor que nosotros hacemos que es dibujar, dibujar de espacios y tratar de representar la, eh, la naturaleza y, y sobre todo el ambiente de los sitios arqueológicos, puede dar pie a colaboraciones como estas. ¿no? Yo espero que si se dan intercambios académicos y científicos con Camboya, sea una experiencia tan bonita como la hemos tenido con la Royal University of Fine Arts. Y pues hago votos para que estas oportunidades de las que estoy muy agradecido puedan repetirse y puedan repercutirse también en, en las nuevas generaciones. Porque eso es lo más importante para nosotros, ¿no? El, la capacidad de sorpresa de los jóvenes y la capacidad de generar sorpresa de nuestros ancestros. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Fernando Aceves, organizador de este coloquio. Este, gracias también al señor Quema y pues, a Marcela y por la traducción simultánea para esta primera conferencia que nos van a acompañar durante los próximos días también. Muchas gracias a toda la gente del colectivo Tequio. Y les damos entonces eh, cita mañana a partir de las 20 horas para la segunda conferencia de este coloquio. Muchas gracias. Excelente noche en México. Y gran y hermoso día hacia Camboya. Y muchas gracias al equipo. Yeah. See you later. Hey. See you. Good Thank day you for Cambodian. We just start working now. <laughs> <laughs>